All right, I uh, hope you had uh, a nice break at the Flexibility Week. Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, uh, pricing models. Uh, we, we mentioned that we are going to use uh, three sessions to talk about the marketing strategies. Uh, last time we talked about the, some base, uh, uh, that is heterogeneity. Uh, uh, customers are different. How do you find a different segment? So uh, today we are going to talk about the pricing. Uh, next week we are going to talk about market response models like advertising. Uh, so uh, these are more uh, detailed marketing strategies that you will uh, actually implement. Uh, so, uh, but before uh, we start today's topic, I have uh, some additional discussion on uh, team team project. Uh, so I assembled uh, some questions uh, that I uh, found from your questions, uh, tutorials, and uh, um, previous experience. All right, so let's uh, quickly go uh, go through them. Uh, first is about the, uh, the focus of the uh, problem. Right. So there's uh, two manager problems. Uh, of course, you can come up uh, with new ones, and uh, uh, you know, with these uh, two managerial pro problems, uh, you uh, can focus on one, right? or even focus on one part of the managerial problem because you only have 15 pages in your report. Right? You cannot solve everything. So it's a depth that I'm looking for. Uh, so uh, if you, your team choose the first managerial question, uh, that is how to estimate the value of customer in the Lloyd program, uh, predict as they will churn or how to manage them accordingly. Right? So if you are um, working on, on this one, uh, the most important part to me is that uh, you will likely uh, put your effort to mainly try to understand the customer behavior at the individual level. Right? So how customers are different, what kind of people will do what, right? that kind of heterogeneity. And then you can uh, base your argument on uh, on this analysis. Uh, if you choose on a second second one, which is how to estimate and justify the value of a little program to each uh, merchant member, uh, of of course, now it's still beneficial to understand the uh, customer heterogeneity at least at the segment level, right? So you don't need to look at each. Uh, people, but maybe there exist uh, two or three segments. Right? Who knows? Right? Uh, if, if you can okay, understand the uh, segment well, that's uh, still the base. Right? But uh, then based on that, you will uh, try to f study the performance of these three merchants from different aspects. Right? So uh, if we talk about uh, the va value, what kind of value? value? Right. Economic value, uh, or uh, does it increase the sales? Uh, does it expand your customer? Does it uh, increase your uh, the pe people's willingness to uh, do business with you or recommend you to other people? Uh, this can all come uh, as value. Right? So you need to look at uh, uh, the program in different aspects and uh, try to justify uh, to each member merchant, uh, what kind of value you have. Right. So one typical uh, uh, observation that I have is uh, uh, after studying all the data, people tend, tend to make the conclusion say, in this loiter program, this uh, petrol station train is most valuable. I find that. Uh, well, that's, uh, I, th I think to a large degree, it perhaps is true in terms of the uh, profit it can, it can generate, right? so uh, the uh, customers it, it can generate. However, uh, you need to think from your customer, right? uh, customer's perspective, who is a manager of this Lloyd program, Jennifer. Right? Uh, so the, you need to think about what kind of uh, uh, solutions that uh, Jennifer is looking for. Is she trying to find uh, which one is the most valuable to the loyalty program? 
I think she knows, right? I think she she knows. Uh, petrol station perhaps is uh, uh, generates the most uh, generates the most uh, customer and no, uh, the mo most most sales, but uh, uh, that is not useful to her, right? She has some problems. Some some uh, member merchant is complaining. So we are more important. Than how come now uh, uh, we we share the same cost? Right? You need to find uh, evidence. To, to show that, uh, uh, well, no, calm down, calm down. Other member merchants are also contribu contributing to your success as well, right? And you can imagine from some member merchants say, hey, no, we are not getting a lot from uh, the loyalty program. So what's the point of uh, participating in the loyalty pro program? Then you can try to show them, say, hey, you know, um, you may not generate a lot of sales, but you can generate, uh, get some other benefit, other values to you, right? That kind of uh, evidence is uh, what uh, Jen Jennifer is looking for. So you, in order to do a successful consulting project, you need to understand what customers want, right? You are also providing some serv service here. So you need to understand your customers' needs. Right? That's very important. So um, don't rush to the conclusion, uh, particularly if you are working on the second managerial problem. I, uh, so our, our conclusion is simple, which one is most valuable? That's not what Jennifer is looking, uh, looking for. I, um, we use the satisfaction as uh, examples in our tutorials. I, I use it uh, uh, mainly, mainly because uh, uh, Mainly because satisfaction is not the end product, right? So I can give you some access, but do not uh, uh, link your access directly to your uh, to your final result. But uh, one uh, side effect of this exercise is that uh, uh, some uh, some teams will focus on satisfaction as the final outcome that they are they are studying. Uh, as a matter of fact, satisfaction is. Uh, a good measure of uh, what is going on, but it's not perhaps not the ultimate goal of firms. All right. uh, it's more more like a, a means to reach the goals. So I want you can imagine all the business eventually they want to get the profit, right? So in order to get profit, I need to keep my customer happy. Are they happy? Right? That's what customer satisfaction is about. It's a uh, uh, means to uh, go to your fi uh, final goal. It's also a valuable measure that you can monitor how your customer is doing. Understand why some customer uh, buy more, some customer leave. Understand the reason, right? And so you can react, uh, uh, to, uh, react to customers accordingly. Right. So that, so we need to be careful, right? Satisfaction is usually not the ultimate goal. At the end, you need to, uh, you want to show pe people value, for example, right? What kind of value? You want to show, show people that value. You perhaps don't want to talk too much about the satisfaction, right? Because it's a mid middle product. It's uh, rather a way to uh, get to your final product. But it's a good, a good variable to measure though. Um, next one is uh, customer heterogeneity. Right. So, uh, shall we treat all these uh, two thousand about two thousand customers as one segment? Right. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps you would at least try, right? Since we have already studied studied customer heterogeneity and the segmentation, you you should at least try to find whether there's any. Uh, segments exist in this uh, uh, entire uh, body of customers. And uh, uh, if you try that, you need to think about it. Right? How do we find a way to segment these customers? Right? So uh, what kind of, we, we talk about uh, these uh, base variables and the descriptors. Right? Uh, if we use class analysis, which variables should we choose for our class analysis? Right? We should certainly choose the base variables, but which are base variables? Which are descriptors? 
for example, gender, right? We know uh, this customer is uh, uh, male or female. Is that a, a base or a descriptor? It is a descriptor, right? It is uh, not uh, a base variable because it does not uh, represent people's needs in this particular case, right? So what, what's the uh, uh, problem if you introduce such a variable such a descriptor as a base variable, right? Uh, maybe you will end up something like that. So uh, among different segments, you have two segments, right? So one segment is, let's say, high value male customer. The other says high value female customer, right? So if you put descriptor in, uh, very likely you will get uh, such kind of two, two segments. But wait a minute. Uh, we just have female, uh, male and a female, right? These two segments, if you don't have this gender descriptor, what will you have? It's just a high value customer, right? Uh, it's the two segments only exist because you artificially put a descriptor in, right? So you artificially separate this this uh, segment into two parts. Right? It should be, for example, high value customer, but now it's a high value male customer and a high value female customer. Right? You don't want to uh, have that, right? So be very careful about which, var var which variable you choose for your class analysis. Right? Of course, in the end, you can analyze, right? Among our uh, high value customer, for example, right? uh, how, what's a percentage of is female? What's a percentage of male? Right. That follow up the analysis is fine, but you don't want to add the descriptors in your class analysis. Right. Uh, uh, next question is a question I uh, gave, gave you last time right, when we talk about customer lifetime value. Since we studied the customer lifetime value, it seems that uh, uh, this matches the project pretty well, right? Except we don't have cost and uh, di discount. Right. Well, you may say we don't have a uh, uh, retention rate as well, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, we need to find a way to, to figure, figure it out if we want to use it, right? Or we, should we just drop it? Right? So we, we talk about uh, this customer lifetime value, right? When we talk about value, we will talk about the profit, right? A profit is sales revenue, right? Sales minus, minus cost. If we don't know cost, uh, what, what, what would, do we know? Uh, we know sales, right? So then we can, without the cost, we are calculating customer lifetime sales. Right? Is that meaningful? Is that meaningful? It still is, right? Because uh, you're, uh, unless you're working on internal consulting project, you don't know about the cost structure, right? That's most, most of the time uh, considered business uh, secret. They will not, not tell you un unless you're an internal person, right? But although this information is not known to you, the manager, they know it very well, right? You tell them you can make 1 million sales. They instantly know, oh, my, uh, every dollar I make, I can uh, make a 20 cents pro profit, 20%, right? So you tell them you can ma make $1 million uh, sales. They will instantly know I can make uh, uh, $200,000 profit, right? So that is, calculation actually is uh, pre pretty uh, straightforward. So if you cannot get a custom lifetime value, custom lifetime sales is very useful as well. So uh, that's kind of little twist you need to uh, twist. You need to be able to do when you comes to practice. Right? In a uh, course, no matter how large the course is, we cannot teach you any everything. Right? We cannot teach you everything. So you always need to twist your tools a bit to match your needs. In this case, no, we don't have cost. But when we don't have cost, we calculate the sales instead of profit, right? And that's still meaningful. And we still can use the same logic to discount the sales in the future in order to get a custom lifetime sales. Right? So it's still useful. Then the two discount rate, uh, discount rate right? So uh, uh, 
the uh, one discount is uh, uh, this uh, inherited business uh, risk. That's kind of, you can think of as given, right? Uh, or very hard to calculate. Uh, now you can use 10% as everyone use <laughs> in the business. Um, but that's not our focus because we, uh, in marketing, we can uh, do very little about this uh, discount rate. Right? On country, retention rate, we also don't have that. Right? But you can uh, calculate that based on the data I, uh, I gave you. Right? Uh, the easiest way is perhaps the overall retention uh, rate. Right? You know how what's the percentage of pe people will uh, will will leave in 2016. Right? Yeah, 2016. There's active and inactive rate. Uh, so customer. Uh, about 75% people are still there. So aggregate level, you can think of the retention like, like that. But if you deal with customer heterogeneity, if you have a multiple segment, or you, you want to look at each individual person, uh, you can also estimate their retention rate, right? Using binary logistic regression. Uh, then you can predict the uh, active probability for each person, right? So uh, there's a way you can uh, get this uh, um, retention rate, be able to discount the future sales. Right? Uh, next question, can conjoint analysis be used uh, in, in the project? Probably not, right? Uh, because we are working on the data we have already collected. Conjoint analysis is, uh, well, at least you need to design a study, right? uh, provide a bunch of profiles. Then you need to ask uh, potential your customers in the loyalty program right, to, to give you uh, answers to your question. And that is not feasible here. Right? Here data has already been collected. Uh, so but not all the methods we teach uh, can be used in this particular project. I choose a product, a project that can cover as uh, much as possible. Um, at the same time, though, is uh, most a common problem shared by uh, most of the business. I, uh, so I intentionally choose a project to cover as much as you can, but I cannot uh, use one project to co cover everything. I, so try as many methods as you can, uh, but it's also true that not every method we teach can be used in this particular project. Uh, next question is that uh, no, we learned the t-test at Nova before, I'm quite good at it. Uh, is it enough if I just use t-test at Nova to show uh, some interesting result? Right? So uh, my response is that uh, uh, if you do find a very interesting result, of course, yes. Right? However, now what I usually observe is that if you can find an interesting result with t-test and ANOVA only, most likely you can uh, use more complicated tools to show even more interesting result. Right? Because uh, uh, things like uh, ANOVA, basically it's a simplified version of regression. Right? And uh, we have learned that uh, in re regression, instead of just uh, use, using one variable like ANOVA does, if you control other variables, you are able to understand the effect of that uh, variable that you're interested in uh, much better. Right? At the same time, it gives you potential to understand the effect of other variables. Right? So uh, you need to expand your skill boundary, right? That's one key, actually that's one key ability we mentioned that uh, a successful uh, analyst should have, right? Constantly expand your skill probability, uh, skill uh, a bound, a boundary and uh, uh, no, keep on improve your result, result, keep on improve your skills to analyze this. So after all, t-test ANOVA, they are mostly the initial steps for you to try to understand the data set, right? You should be able to get uh, more interesting results with more sophisticated tools. So on your final product, here's uh, a few other words, right? Uh, don't dump a lot of analysis in there, right? In this course, I'm not uh, 
look, I'm not looking for a report that uh, says you did a lot of analysis. I'm looking for a report that says you find very interesting insights. That's what I'm looking for, right? You know, you, of course you need to run many analysis in order to get uh, some uh, very interesting insights, uh, but I'm, I will only look at your final analysis that leads to the interesting uh, insights. The other trials right, basically does not matter in the final report. So do not dump many analysis in, in the res, res, uh, report or presentation. Right? Uh, you should try many, but only select those that matters. Right? And in your report, right, try to put together a synthesizer story. A typical observation is that uh, now we have uh, five team members, let's say. Right? E uh, each one write a part of it and someone may not even know what other people are doing. Right? That does not make it a good report. Right? So everyone should go through the analysis. This is marketing analytic courses. That's, that's kind of expected, right? Everyone should also contribute to, to the report and thoroughly understanding what other people are doing. Right? So that will make this a synthesized uh, story for you to tell. Uh, another observation is that uh, now a question like that, we identify a segment which is uh, profit, uh, profitable. So uh, that, that's great. I will focus on that segment, all right? That's the most common statement we make. But now that is good you find some uh, interesting segment, but what about the other 95% customer? Uh, whatever you do, all right? is likely observed by other customer as well. When you design a strategy to fo focus on that 5% of customer, what do you think other 95% of people will react, right? So your story need to be synthesized. Your strategy also need to be synthesized. You need to uh, uh, have a big picture of how I'm going to do each segment of customer. Now, if I implement one strategy, will, I, will the customer from another segment consider it to be fair? Right? Fair is very important, right? Uh, currently 90% of customer may not uh, be so profit, but uh, if you do something wrong, they will just, uh, just leave. Can you afford that? Um, your recommendation, all right? Uh, needs to, you need to think thoroughly about, about your recommendation, right? Is it actionable? How are you going to implement this? When you implement this, will other people in this program consider it fair? Uh, what kind of message will you receive? What do, do will this, uh, what's their perception is about you, all right? So you need to think about that caref carefully. The more you think up through this, the better your strategy will be. Uh, another thing is uh, significance. Right? We talk about the significance when we discuss regression, right? but I guess uh, well, I cannot emphasize more on that right? uh, because we are trained uh, always look for some significant result. Right? Uh, well, significant result is good, but understand why is more important. Right? So if you, um, you, want, you need to think thoroughly right, to understand why you get some result. So well, for example, why some variables are significant, some are not. Now, uh, for example, you expect a variable to be significant, but it's not. Right? This is this actually very informative, right? Because that, that says your prior belief is wrong. Right? And you can, if manager do have that belief, you can correct the managers. Uh, about their mistake, right? You need to understand why there's a positive, why there's a negative. Uh, they could be significant, but you expect a positive significant. It turns out to be negative significant, <laughs> right? Uh, you need to understand why. The unexpected results are very informative, right? Some impact are larger than others, I don't know why. Right. So it's, uh, uh, significance itself 
it's not the insights, right? Why it is significant, why it's positive, negative, why it's large or small, uh, that is insights. All right, so that is uh, uh, some common questions that I put together. Do you have some other questions for me? No? Okay, uh, let's start today's uh, topic on pricing. Uh, pricing. Pricing is uh, uh, one of the four P's, right? Uh, product, place, uh, promotion, price. And the pricing is very important because uh, that's uh, perhaps the only way you can harvest the value back. But uh, uh, not like other pro features you offer. Other features are try to offer value to customer, right? Uh, prices try to harvest from customer. So you need to be extra careful on uh, price. Understand how uh, when you charge people some price, how will the demand uh, demand change? Right? So uh, that's the topic we are going to talk about today. Right? First, we will talk about some series, so you understand the uh, pricing better. Right? That includes uh, demand curve. Right? What is demand? Price elasticity. Uh, how do you optimize your pr uh, price based on demand curve? Right? Then we will talk some uh, about some pr pricing practices. Right? The, because the practice is not entirely matched the series, there are some deviations you need to keep in mind. Oh, by, by the way, I updated my uh, slides, uh, three, three of them. Right? So uh, uh, I put the updated slides on, on Moodle. If you download it before yesterday afternoon, uh, you can download this again. Right? Uh, so this is the one slides I uh, updated. I think this illustrated a bit better. Right? So uh, pri pricing, uh, uh, here we talk about a value-based pricing. Right? What do I mean by value-based pricing? Right? Wherever we uh, offer product or service, we give customers some value. Right? So this uh, chart says now on the left side here, you say zero, right? Zero means I do not offer any product or, or service. Right? Wherever I create some product or deliver some service, that uh, will give customer some value. That is a value to customer, right? So the entire, uh, this part is a value to customer. But at the same time, it will also induce some cost to the company, right? That is a total cost over here. So the difference between value to customer and the total cost, that is a value you created right, by uh, offering this product or service. Then, what is price or pricing? Right? Pricing is how you divide this created value between you and your customer, right? So this is a value uh, you created, your price is over here. So basically this part, right? This part, uh, this part called the margin, right? Margin is the amount of money you can make, right? Um, on top of the, the, uh, the cost. So this margin is your value. Right? And as a value, uh, the other part of value is distributed to customer. Right? So margin is easy to understand, but in marketing, we have another account, a concept. Right? I may have different names, but uh, let's call it a contribution over here. Right? Contribution is a price, a difference between price and the variable cost, the variable cost. Right. So uh, it, it, the, when we uh, produce a product, for example, there are two parts of cost. Right? One part of cost is a variable. That is the cost that you uh, need to pay to make every piece of new product. Right? But there's uh, some other cost as well. For example, the cost of the, uh, the factory, right? the cost of setting up the machine, the cost of manufacturing, uh, 
all these will, this is called a fixed cost. The fixed cost want to change if you, uh, for example, make one additional piece of product. Uh, those are fixed cost. The, uh, but for each new piece of product you make, uh, you will create some variable cost. So that, that's a, di a difference. In uh, marketing, we care more about contribution, contribution, right? Because fixed cost is already there. Well, if we uh, sell one more piece of product, as long as the price is larger than the variable cost, then the, the contribution will be positive, right? We can make some additional money. And then in that case, we should sell this product. Right? Later, I will show you an, uh, additional slides to uh, give you more, more example. But uh, here I want you to uh, mind the difference between margin and the contribution. Right. So now uh, here's a question, how can you charge your price? How can you charge your price? That's related to another concept in this uh, chart that we haven't talked yet. That is a perceived value. Right. They are saying in marketing, uh, perception is everything. Right. It's actually does not matter too much. What is a real value to customers? It is most important how consumers perceive the value. So if you have, uh, uh, let's uh, let, let's say a cup, right? A, a, a cup. So the, this this cup, uh, the real value to me may be ten dollars, right? ten dollars. But I uh, I don't feel like that. My perceived value is only five dollars. Then how much can you charge me? Can you charge me ten dollars? Because the real value to you is ten dollars. No, you can't. Can you charge me eight dollars? No. I will not buy it because I think it's maximum to the maximum, it only was $5. As a result, you can only charge me below my perceived value, right? In order to, for me to buy it, right? Uh, if you charge me any price beyond my perceived value, I will not buy it. A, a price is only valid for purchase if it is below the perceived value. Uh, in country, for example, the, uh, this cup of uh, uh, this cup, the real value to me is ten dollar, right? But I think it is worth twenty dollars. For example, uh, I I visited this university before. I, I take this as a souvenir, all right? Uh, I, so I, I think I would pay twenty dollars to uh, buy this buy this cup. There was a price you can charge me, or well, you can charge me up to twenty dollars, right? Although the true value is just a $10 for me to drink water, but uh, you can charge me $20 because I think it is worth up to $20, All right? So that is a perceived value. Most of the time, the perceived value will be lower the, uh, than the value, the real value to customers. Right? So most time is over here. So uh, then now uh, your price, needs to be below that perceived value. So this is the chart we can analyze one individual. How about we aggregate such kind of analysis for the entire group of customers that you're looking at? Right? Then we have a distribution. Right? Distribution. We say this perceived value is a maximum amount I would like to pay for a product like this. Right? So that is my willingness to pay or WTP, right? Uh, willingness to pay. I have a, a willingness to pay over here. You have a willingness to pay over here. When we pull everyone in the market together, we have a distribution. Right? Here is a distribution. Here, willingness to pay is a from lower number to high number. And at each number, we have certain amount of people to form the distribution. So the, here's a normal distribution, right? You can see most of people would like to pay price around here right, for this product, right? So then uh, if you charge people, if you charge people 
at price P, P1. P1. Right. What is your customer? Who are, who are your customer? Everyone who has a willing to pay that is higher than your price P1, right? So, uh, so uh, let's let's say we're to pay increase from this end to uh, to that end, right? Uh, so you charge people price one, you are going to get customer who's willing to pay is higher than P1. Uh, okay, so, 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 sorry, let excuse me. Let me restate state this. So the willing to pay here is from the left side is lower end. The right side is uh, high, higher end, all right? So if you charge P1, any person who is willing to pay lower than P1, that is the shadow part, they will not buy from you. People with willing to pay higher than P1, they will buy from you. So people here, this amount of people, they will buy from you. People here, they will buy from you. So the total demand is the uh, area over here. That is the total demand. So if you charge a higher price, let's say P2, then this shadowed part, they will not buy from you because they are willing to pay is lower than P2. Only people with willing to pay higher than P2, this red part will buy from you. Right? So, so you can see as you increase your price, the demand will shrink. So the equation that shows this relationship, shows how you change price and the demand will change, that we call the demand curve. Demand curve is how you demand a change with the price. It's a relationship. Show, uh, it's a, a curve that shows this relationship. We have multiple forms of demand curve. Right? The easiest to understand is perhaps uh, a linear curve. Right? Linear curve is, is like that. Right? So let's look at uh, Q1, the deep blue one. Right. So uh, here is a, a price from low to high, demand from low to high. So if your price is lowest, of course, your quant uh, quantity demand right, will be highest. When you increase your uh, price, your demand will decrease. Uh, then over here, then, then the quantity is gone. Right? Um, so this is a demand curve. Q2 is also a demand curve, another demand curve. Curve, right? Q2 is another demand curve like here. You can see Q2 is steeper than Q1. Here B2 is uh, la larger than uh, B B1. Uh, that, that, that means for this demand curve, it, when you increase price, the quantity will drop uh, more sharply, right? It will drop, drop quicker. So that's a difference between uh, these two. Late, later, we will talk about the uh, price, uh, price elasticity, right? So here, uh, it's the same price. You can see Q2 right? for the demand curve Q2, the price sensitivity is uh, more sensitive, more sensitive than Q1. Um, another one is uh, this power curve, power demand curve, right? It's like that. So when you uh, price increase as expected, the quantity should drop, right? uh, but uh, it's not a drop linear, but uh, as, as, a, as a curve. Right? Uh, this has a good feature that the price, price elasticity is constant over here. Right? We will, I will show, show you later about another form. So I have uh, talked about elasticity for a couple of times now. Right? What, what is elasticity? Right? Elasticity is when I make a fraction change in price, what is the fraction change in demand? 
note that this is a fraction change, right? So it's uh, the new price minus old price divided by old price. It's a percentage change, not the absolute value, not how I, uh, whether I drop $1 or $2. It's about, I drop 1% of my price, 2% of my price, things like that, right? So when that happens, what is a fraction change? What is a percentage change in demand? That uh, uh, result is called uh, price elasticity. Price elasticity. Uh, so given, uh, take this uh, demand curve, uh, linear demand curve as example. When we draw a line here, P star, uh, we start with P star. Now say I change a price, I drop a price, delta P, delta P. So the new price will be P star minus delta P, right? So uh, when you drop a price over here, the quantity will also drop, will, will also change. Actually, it should increase because you dropped the price, right? So in curve uh, Q1, your, the point will move from here to here. Right? Let me highlight this. Um, I, So when you change your price from uh, here to here, your demand curve will move up, will move up, right? So uh, the older demand was Q1 star, but new demand is uh, here uh, with a difference, delta Q1. Similarly, the demand, if your demand curve is Q2, it will also move up, but it will move up more right? because the curve is steeper. Uh, so the delta Q2 will be larger than delta Q1, right? From here to here. This is new quantity based on demand curve two. So at a certain price P star, you can find that uh, this elasticity of Q2, absolute value, its absolute value is larger than the absolute value of uh, elasticity in Q1. Now, so why absolute value? Because in this equation, when we increase price, the quantity will drop, right? When we decrease price, the quantity will increase. So most of the time, this elasticity is a negative number. It's a negative number, right? Um, most of the time. So uh, for ease of interpretation, usually we talk about uh, the absolute value of elasticity. And in some books, you will see people uh, don't even say the absolute value of elasticity. They, they will just say the elasticity is one or two, but they actually mean the elasticity is minus one or minus two, because most of the case, it's always a negative number. The book, no, many book assume that everyone knows about that, right? So they just say elasticity is one or two, but they, it actually means uh, minus one or minus two. So keep in mind about that. A good thing about this uh, uh, power demand curve is that the elasticity is constant at each point. Right? It may uh, not look uh, crystal clear, right? but if you uh, uh, use calculus, you can derive that. Right? So this is optional. So I will uh, just, just show you over here, uh, but the elasticity here is, constantly B, right? and B is, uh, uh, should be a negative number. It's a curve, curve like here. So this is a, a constant elasticity demand curve. It's a in power curve, in power curve format. A quick example. Right? So uh, you have this equation, right? uh, original P, is 10 and the quantity is 1000. Now elasticity is uh, minus two. I uh, increase the price from $10 to $11. What is the new quantity, Q1, All right? So there's uh, multiple ways you can do it. You can just uh, put all this number in there, right? minus two over here, uh, P1, P0 over here and the calculator Q1. You can also transform this equation into something like here and then calculate it. 
right? So this should be straightforward. I'm, I'm sure every one of you can uh, get this done, right? Uh, another example is uh, this uh, elasticity absolute value equals one, right? This actually does not have uh, much magic over here, but in economics, it's uh, have a special name called uh, uh, unit elasti elastic. Right. That means 1% of change will lead to the exact same 1% change in, uh, in, in, de in demand. Right. So elasticity larger than one, it means when you just said uh, your quantity changes faster than your price change. So you change 1% uh, uh, in price, the quantity will change larger than 1%. Right? And the elasticity is smaller than one means the quantity change will be slower than, um, than your price change. Right? So that's the uh, only thing. Uh, I don't think it's practically it has much implication, but uh, our, our concept uh, that people talk about. So I show you as well. So, when we know this demand curve, after we know this demand curve, can we do something? <clears throat> can we find the optimal price, the best price that get us our, for example, um, maximum profit, right? People may have different target. You need to know that. Uh, many times people will say, I will maximize my profit, but sometimes people will say, no, I want to uh, maximize my market share, or I want to maximize prof prof profit given that I reach a certain level of market share, right? Or th there could be many different targets. So we will start with a very simple one that is simply maximize your profit, right? Let's say we don't have any other constraints. Uh, we just uh, maximize our, our profit. So how are we going to do that? Right, let me show, show you over here. So here is our demand curve. You can see I use the power demand curve over here. Right. So the current status is, uh, <clears throat> is I charge price P1, the so quantity is Q1. Right. And uh, here from zero to uh, this variable cost, so VC is variable cost. That is uh, uh, variable cost, right? Uh, and this part, P1 minus variable cost, that is our contribution. Right? Yeah, remember, contribution is compared to uh, the variable cost, not the total cost. Right? So now we decrease price. Right? Decrease price from P1 to P2. What will happen? Right? You you will know that this uh, power on you know, this power curve the demand, uh, the point will move from here, the original point to here. Because your price drops, the demand move up to the new quantity Q2. So compare the left part and the right part. Right? You, you will see uh, this is a total money incoming, right? And uh, uh, the, uh, this part is a to your total variable cost and the, the rest part is total contribution. In the new scenario, the total incoming cash is like here. The total cost is over here. Yes, the, you used to be this part of variable cost, but since you have uh, more quantity, you are going to have additional variable cost, right? And at the same time, your, uh, you will have this part as a new contribution. Compared to the older part, this part, the, the white part is not affected. The green part is uh, increased contribution due to, uh, due to the increased demand, right? On the other hand, you lose this orange part because for each one in quantity Q1, you used to charge them price P1, but now you can only charge them price P2, remember? That is one price for everyone, right? Uh, so 
you, people will see it unfair as you know, if you charge me $10, charge other people $5, right? That's unfair. I will not uh, buy it with $10 because other people can buy it with $5. Right? Why do you charge me 10, right? So you cannot do that. So uh, you will lose contribution because uh, of the price decrease. Right? So now you need to make a decision. We, uh, which price should I uh, should I use? Now you can keep on moving on this demand curve, right? To find the optimal point where your contribution is maximized. All right. So uh, why contribution uh, instead of margin? Right? So here's a, a example for you. Uh, in this example, my total cost is twenty dollars. Right? Uh, variable cost is ten dollar. That means now uh, to make additional piece of product, it only cost me ten dollars. But uh, the other cost, uh, uh, factory management, they are shared by each piece of the product is about ten dollars. Right? Now the thing is that consumers perceive this product as. Uh, uh, now the willing to pay is no more than fifteen dollar, right? No more than fifteen dollar. That's the price you can charge maximum, right? Uh, in this case, your margin will be negative because the total cost is twenty dollar. If you sell one product at fifteen dollar, you will lose five dollar, right? But your contribution is positive, five dollar. The question is that whether you want to sell at a price 15, if you can only charge that much, right? deal or no deal. If you sell this product, right? Uh, because the variable cost is ten, uh, $10. So it means five dollars, you can make $5 contribution. In the end, you will lose the total loss in $5 after you consider the fixed cost, right? Another scenario is not sell. So you, you do not sell this product. There's no cost, no variable cost from this product. You have no contribution. And in the end, what? The fixed cost is still there. You lose $10 uh, fixed cost. Right? So in marketing, if you have already set up your factory already, May, uh, start making this product. The fixed cost is already there. You should always sell a product when the contribution is positive, right? But uh, total cost is uh, still variable, right? When you think about uh, uh, at the very beginning, whether you should start this project, right? Uh, then you find that you can only charge people $15 while the total cost is up to $20 then you should not do this project, right? You should not do this project from the very beginning. You should not put in the fixed cost. But as long as your fixed cost is already there, right? Uh, the question comes, should you make another product uh, to get some positive contribution or not? And it's definitely yes, right? Uh, so you may think, why do people you know, do a project like that from the very beginning? Well, what is very complicated, right? It can change. So initially you think you can charge people $25, but then you come with a very powerful competitor. Now things change. Now you can only, or maybe COVID-19 happens. Now people don't want to buy this product anymore, right? You can only charge people $15. Are you still going to sell it or not? You should, as long as the contribution is positive. So, uh, how to do optimization. Right. Again, we are going to use Excel. As I told you, Excel is a very powerful tool. Right. The optimization tool is very handy for, for us to, to use. Right. So let me show, show you uh, this example. And after that, we will have a, a break. So this is uh, called the uh, uh, lip palm stick. All right. Uh, our data is like that. The unit cost or the variable cost, right? Uh, it, uh, right, he, he, here is, um, this, this is a total cost, 
total, total cost. Yes, uh, uh, we, we will see that the contribution is always uh, positive because even the profit is positive. Right? So uh, here, the data, we only have three data points. Uh, the more uh, data we have, of course, of course will, more precise it will be. Right? But in this case, uh, three demand, we can still work on that. Right? So uh, three scenario, th scenarios, when there's a low price, one point, $1.15, the demand is 60, uh, whatever unit it is, maybe 60 uh, million, maybe. Uh, uh, just a, a numerical example. So let's make it simple, 60. Uh, medium price, $2.30. <laughs> High price, $2.50, uh, 20. Uh, so we uh, want to uh, first uh, get the demand curve. Uh, demand curve is how price change leads to demand curve. Uh, there's some uh, handy product of uh, handy function we can use in Excel uh, called a scatter plot. Or if you first select these, uh, scatter plot. We choose this this one, right? scatter plot, and you can see now on on the plot you have find the vertical one is a demand, horizontal one is a price. And the three spot is on the uh, is our, is our data. Right? So the demand curve should ideally go through uh, the, these three data points. Right? So let's make it uh, uh, a little bit easier to uh, look at. Right? Minimum, let's say one one dollar. Right? Uh, so a bit in the center. Right? So now we want to um, add a trend line. Right click on the right click on the data point. Add a trend line. So this trend line will show show us how demand change when we change price. Right? And you can see there's uh, multiple options we have. Okay, we can give it a try. Right, exponential. Uh, well, it uh, looks like it fits the, this curve better, right? So this is linear. This is a logarithm uh, polynomial. Well, this, this is very good, right? Polynomial. Uh, polynomial ba basically introduce higher order um, items in there, right? So the order two means you add a price square term. Right? If you increase, Three, four, now that means you add a uh, the three, for example, you add a quadratic term of price. Right? Here we are only have uh, two or uh, three data points and uh, uh, this uh, square term, uh, square term is good enough. But you can also try other like power curve. Power is also good, right? Power also good, not perfect, but uh, also good. Moving average, uh, no, that's not good. So let's stay with uh, polynomial. Then you can uh, click on this one, display equation on the chart. Then this equation will be demonstrated over here. Right? So you can uh, give it a try. So if you increase this three order, right? uh, our three here quadratic is not useful right? because we only have three data point. Right? So this is uh, the equation, uh, equation we got and uh, we have a name for that, that is a demand curve. <laughs> demand curve. That is how we draw this, uh, draw this curve. And uh, we are going to use this equation to maximize our, uh, to find our optimal price. So how do we find the optimal price? All right. We uh, first need to set up equation here. Right. We are going to use this cell use this cell to uh, get the optimal price. But so far we don't know, but let's uh, put in a number first, right? like $2, right? Uh, the demand, the demand given that price can be calculated as here 40 times, we are going using this equation, right? 40 times this price square, uh, if you don't know square, you can time it twice. That also works, right? Uh, minus 200 times the uh, price 
plus 270. This demand. Now, when you change this price, you can see the demand will change, right? 1.8, for example, this will change, right? So, uh, and the profit you can make, profit you can make is the price you charge minus the cost. That is a unit profit you make, right? Times the demand. So that's a profit you're going to, going to make here, right? So uh, the next job is to optimize, find a price that maximize our profit. Right? Let's uh, take a look. Right? So we do have uh, uh, some considerations here. Right? When we maximize the profit, we need to make sure that the price we choose they are not negative. They are in a certain range. In this case, the uh, uh, reasonable range is between 1.5 to 2.5 because we know this area well. We get the demand curve based on this range. Outside this range, it may keep on being a curve like that or may not. The thing is that we do not know, right? We do not know. So it's mostly reasonable for us to assume that uh, we find a price within this range. Then sometimes we may have inventory limit. For example, our demand, let's say, cannot be, oh, sorry, I, how did I, All right, let me set up profit again. So I uh, mistakenly damaged the uh, demand equation. Demand equation should be the same as this one, right? So the profit is uh, uh, price minus cost times demand. Right? This is, uh, this makes sense, right? okay? So uh, sometimes inventory limit, sometimes you demand, uh, demand can be too large for you to serve them. For example, if you provide 1.5, the demand will be 60, but you only have 50. Let's say you only have 50. Then you need to add a restriction that demand cannot go beyond 50, right? So that's a, another possible constraint. And there could be other constraints as well. For example, your competitors, et cetera, right? uh, whether they will react to your uh, price price change, right? How that is going to happen? Uh, this will go, are going to be uh, very complicated. All right, so once we uh, set set up this, we are going to use a tool called uh, Solver. Right, Solver. I have not loaded over here, but we loaded once when we uh, use uh, this uh, real stats add-in. So go to add-in. Excel adding. This time we don't need this real stat. We just need this uh, solver adding. Right. Click OK. And we have the solver over here. Right. Solver says, first I set objective. I want to, the objective is profit, total profit. Right. Total profit I want to maximize, not minimize, I want to maximize. How do I achieve maximize profit? I can change this price input. By changing this price input, I want to maximize the total profit, right? Then we can add some constraints, right? For example, this price must be positive, right? Must be positive. Right? For example, the price can only with, uh, stay within $1.50 and $2.50, right? So if that's the case, then I, uh, uh, can change this larger than 1.5, okay? Right. I can add another, this price must be smaller or equal to 2.5. So this is within range, right? Uh, so uh, if you can even, uh, can, if you have inventory limitation, let's say you can add another, uh, demand is uh, smaller than 50, okay, okay. 
then can solve. Right? So in this case, we first uh, uh, delete this inventory uh, limitation. Uh, click solve. So it says solver have found a solution. All constraints are optimal. Keep solver solution. So this uh, solution says you should choose a price that is $1.62. Given that price, the profit will be maximized. And the maximum profit is 36.7. Right. So, so solver sometimes stay, uh, get into local optimum. Right. So it's worthwhile for us to run this for a couple of times. Right. This result does not change. So we know it's the optimal price. Right. So that's how we get the optimal uh, price, which optimize our uh, total profit. Uh, let's take a five minutes break and we will come, come back and talk about some pricing, uh, pricing practices. All right, uh, let me uh, say this uh, again. Uh, so the, in the real world, the price the practice can be very complicated. Uh, when you uh, drop price, it's not necessary demand will increase. Uh, for example, consumers may uh, make inference of price change. When you drop price, they may think, huh, the price is about to be uh, superseded by a newer model. So in that case, I perhaps should wait and uh, uh, see what is the new model is, right? Or maybe the product is have some faults. Uh, it's just, I don't know. Uh, other people know it's not selling well, so they are dropping the price. Uh, or maybe the company is financial trouble, or maybe you know, I should keep on waiting. Maybe they will drop price further, et cetera. Uh, so all, all, all these may lead to demand, uh, demand not only uh, in, uh, not only not increase, but uh, even, even drop. On the other hand, when you increase price, people, demand may possibly go, go up because people may think the product's hot. I should buy as early as possible. Uh, later, no, uh, it may go out of stock, right? So, uh, or maybe the product is unusually good, right? Uh, there may be more price increase in the future, I, so I should buy it now. Right? So, although price, uh, this tells us that uh, although price change is easy, uh, perhaps the easiest uh, among all marketing strategies, uh, you just need to change the number, right? Uh, but uh, uh, it's actually not as easy as uh, it seems. Right? You should, uh, when you change your price, most uh, most likely you need to provide some valid reason. Right? That's why we see a lot of promotions going on, right? So they eventually think about it. You know, what they really want to do is just to give you a low price. So the quantity should increase. Right? But they always come, come up with a reason. For example, you know, it's uh, a Mother's Day. It's Father's Day, so I give you some promotion, right? So. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, Christmas season, so everything is on sale, right? Come and buy from us. I, essentially, they want to give you a low price so the demand will increase, but they need to find a valid reason for that. Otherwise, they, they say nothing and they drop the price. Think about it. What will you think about it, right? You will come up with various reasons as listed here, here right? So uh, the demand, you may not see the demand increase as expected. Um, when we do pricing strategies, right, there's, uh, uh, we can uh, offer different price to different people. Right? It is possible. Right? We need to do it in a smart way so people don't see it as uh, unfair. So it's a, a, a theory called price discrimination. Right? So the word is not a, a very good, discrimination. Right? It sounds a bad, bad word, uh, but that's what it is, essentially is. Right? Offer, offering different price based 
uh, based on different uh, situations. Right? But when you choose the situations carefully, people will consider it to be fair rather than unfair. Right? So theoretically, there are three levels of price discrimination. Right? The first degree of price discrimination is basically charge consumers exactly what they want to pay for product. So uh, there, there's very uh, few cases uh, belong to this category because uh, doing the first degree price discrimination is very hard. Right? So one possible scenario may be auction. auction right? For example, I, uh, I, there's uh, um, uh, extreme storm out there. Right? Uh, we, uh, our, our roof got damaged. I need to get it fixed. Right. So I, we are all in this room, right. bid for a tender to fi fix the room. Right. So in that case, I will ask now, who, uh, here's a tender, who, how much would you like to offer? Right. So here, fi 500, great. More than 500? 600. Uh, well, you have 700. More, no more than 700? Okay, deal. Right. So the person who offers 700 got the first tender. So after this tender is, is gone, the roof got fixed uh, first. Then now we get offer the second opportunity, right? Second opportunity. Uh, who would like to pay? Right? 600? 650? Okay, great. 650. Right? So in that, in that case, one by one, you can charge every customer with what they are willing to pay. Right? Uh, the, well, this uh, perhaps a firm will get the most profit, but as you can imagine from consumer's perspective, perspective they will not be happy. So second degree is offer consumers uh, a menu of options at the different prices based on quantity demand. Right? So the a typical uh, example is wholesale retail. Right? Uh, this we, people consider to be fair. Right? So if you buy a lot, you get a lower price. If you go only get one or two piece, now you get a, a higher higher price. People think it's uh, fair. A third degree uh, is now divide the cons uh, customers into different seg segments. Then for each segment, you charge a different price. Right? But your product for each segment should also be a little bit different. Otherwise, people still think it's unfair, right? But if your product offer for the uh, different segment are different. And at the same time, you charge a different price. People uh, will have less issue about that. So uh, one, one typical uh, is that uh, now uh, laptop, for example, right? uh, our home use laptop, usually they are cheap. They do not come with a lot of service, right? but business uh, business grade laptop. They're not necessarily fast uh, or more more pow powerful, but they usually comes with more service, right? And they are actually charge a lot more than uh, home home use la laptop, right? So that is uh, the, you give uh, the differential people in two segments: uh, individual se home use segments and business segment. You offer perhaps similar product, but there were different levels of service. Right? Uh, well, implementing the first degree price discrimination is very difficult. Uh, usually you uh, you, there's a, a lot of reasons. Here I have uh, listed four. Uh, usually you need to be the monopoly seller to do that. Right? As long as you have competitors, it's very hard to achieve that. Right? Uh, you need also need to know how much people are, uh, would like to pay. They usually don't tell you, right? Uh, in an auction, maybe you can do, uh, get a sense of their reserved price, but um, no, uh, you cannot always do things like auction. Right? There's potential for arb arbitrage. Right? Arbitrage is uh, things like that. For example, we're bidding for tender, right? I, I know. Uh, so my own uh, personal willing to pay for the tender is $500. But I know my friend who is not here, right? Uh, she is willing to pay $1,000, right? So what I, will I do? Right? I can get a tender with $700 in this room, right? Then I go out and sell this tender to my friend. She will 
uh, uh, pay, pay me $1,000, I can make $300 profit. Then I come back and uh, uh, find another tender we are up to $500, right? So uh, in that way, I can make some uh, money uh, because you are setting up this first degree price discrimination, right? That's called uh, arbitra arbitrage opportunity. And uh, perhaps very important, our customer uh, view is unfair. So they will not uh, buy from you uh, at all you know, if you have any competitors, right? So uh, this is uh, what I talk, uh, talk about uh, uh, this uh, differ differential pricing with differential service. The product can be similar, but the uh, service can be different. Right? Individual use home laptop, uh, uh, they are kind of usually low level customers. Uh, you give them a laptop at the same time, a little bit of service, right? that for this segment. For the high value customers, you perhaps a very similar product, but you give them a lot more service. I remember when my laptop, it was bought by USW, right? So it got broken. I can just mail it back to a company, it's Dell. At the same time though, they will send me a new laptop for me to use when they are fixing this, this laptop. Right. That kind of service. So uh, you, you think about why people would uh, uh, even buy you know, those very expensive laptop, right? But you think from uh, the company's perspective, in this, US, in this case, USW, right? So if the, I have a laptop that uh, go, go wrong, I cannot fix it. Right? So because it's business purpose, they need to either find someone, they hire some IT guy to fix it for me, or got this service provide, for, provided by Dell, now that a manufacturer can fix it for me. So to uh, the company, it's either pay uh, the company to provide more service or to hire more people, which cost them even more. Right? So that's the reason people would like to have that additional amount of ser service. And that's uh, quite expensive. Actually, I, I remember my laptop just for three years service is uh, $300. Right? Uh, that, that's actually quite expensive. <clears throat> but there's other way you can uh, provide a differential pricing as well. One we already talked about is the second degree because those are uh, first degree, second degree, third degree, they are economic. Uh, terms. Right? Uh, in marketing, we just uh, treat the different prices, differential pricing. Right? So quantity is one way to differentiate your pricing. But there are other ways as well. For example, geographic. Right? We know Apple charges us different price uh, in Australia and in, in uh, United States. Right? Um, we pay a lot more here in Australia if you want to get an Apple product. Right? So uh, also temporal. Right? Time of making reservation. I'm going to show you an example of airlines. Right? We know that when airlines you book early, more likely you get a cheap price. Right? Cost of serving account, that is similar to the example we just talked about. Uh, and even some uncertainty, right? that's something interesting. Let me show you this example. Uh, this is a screenshot I got from eBay. Right? So uh, here you can uh, see that the, the same product, uh, same brand, right? same, same brand. If I buy three t-shirts with known color, white or black, uh, I pay $115, right? However, here, this product is called a three random color. So same brand, same quality, just a different color. And uh, I don't know which color I'm buying, right? Got three t-shirts, I only pay $109, right? So in this, in this case, uh, <clears throat> in this case, this seller on eBay can find a different segment of customer. Those segment, segment who care about the color they get, care about this certainty. I right? will talk about uncertainty. Right? Care about this certainty. Certainty, they pay 115. Those who do not care about certain certainty 
pay six dollars less, right? So that's how you use uncertainty to find a different seg segment. Similar example is uh, this called opaque, uh, opaque inventory. Uh, I also got this screenshot from What If. Right? What If is a website uh, that you can book hotel. Uh, uh, it's very popular in Australia. And uh, they have this called, uh, called mysterious hotels. So basically it tells the information about the hotel, uh, 4.5 star or even five star. Right? Uh, but you don't know what it, which hotel exactly it is. And you can see you pay a very cheap price for even a five star hotel, right? Um, I think a typical five star, you perhaps at least pay like three, 400, right? But uh, uh, you still stay in a five star hotel. It's just so uh, you don't know which style of hotel you, 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 are, you are staying and you got a lot cheaper price. Right. So, but in this way, using uncertainty, they differentiate the customer from people who uh, need to be very certain. Right. I have to know this is a hotel I'm staying right. against another segment who uh, don't really care about uh, which hotel, as long as I get the service described over here, I'm happy. At the same time, I can pay a uh, much lower price. So you serve both segments without lowering the entire price. Do you still remember the price optimization chart I give you? Right? So when you lower price, you will lose the orange part where you can originally charge people this price. But when you lower price, you can no longer charge that much. You will lose your contribution because you lower price. So in this case, I this hotel still have not lowered the price for their original rooms, right? And those customers who uh, have to know where they are staying, right? They're, paying, they're still, still paying the same price, but those customers who don't care, right, they pay low price. In that way, they can expand their sales without lowering the entire price range, right? Um, Another, another very typical one uh, to differentiate your price is to uh, use temporal uh, factor. Right. So those factors, uh, those examples are like hotels uh, and airlines. Both of them have very high fixed cost. Right. For airline, you need to fly from one place to another no matter how many people are on a flight, right? Uh, there's uh, 10 people you are gonna fly. There's, uh, well, there's 100 people you can also, you also fly. The fixed cost is very high, but the marginal cost, right? So additional one passenger on the flight, the additional uh, fuel you need to burn or additional junk food that you need to serve, right? Uh, those variable costs are very low, very low. Hotels, right? no matter, people stay in the hotel or not, the building is there, right? The fixed cost is here. But uh, as long as you can sell another additional room, right? So the variable cost to clean everything, you know, to put some additional toilet paper in the room, that's kind of a very low variable cost. Right? So people, for those uh, industry, people have uh, thought a lot about now how I can charge different customers with different uh, uh, prices, right? So this uh, opaque inventory, uh, maybe uh, maybe one example to deal with that. And a more common way is to uh, employ this temporal uh, temporal price discrimination. All right. So they go, manage these through a revenue managed uh, system. So let me show, show you this uh, video case. All right. I need to make this video work for you. Uh, let me see. How... Give me a second. I will... As we all know, the 
Now, now I guess you can hear it, right? Can you hear? That's a very nice way of saying price discrimination, right? Sell the right product to the right customer at the right price. The development of an effective system of yield management has been absolutely key to American Airlines' success since deregulation. Without the ability to manage yields, a price competitive market would present us with only two options match deeply discounted fares by reducing the price of our entire inventory which would reduce revenues drastically, or elect not to match and thus lose market share, which would also cost vast amounts of revenue. Yield management gives us a third alternative, to match deeply discounted fares on a portion of our inventory and offer only higher price tickets on flights and at times when demand is strong. By controlling the number of seats we sell at each fare, we can effectively adjust our minimum available fare to account for differences in demand. During the past 20 years, American Airlines has made continuing progress towards effectively controlling the availability of reservations. In the 1960s, we first applied scientific methods to determine how heavily to overbook. In the 1970s, we began allocating discount seats using operations research techniques. In the 1980s, we developed the first integrated approach to controlling sales by customer origin and destination, rather than by physical flight segment. You can see that uh, analytics is uh, behind the, this, right? So in order to um, design this system, a lot of uh, prediction estimation needs to be, to be done in order to understand how the system should, should work, in order to optimize this, this work, right? So, this uh, uh, analytics uh, was uh, uh, used way a long, long time ago. Uh, and, and nowadays, you can imagine this kind of system is uh, more and more rely on uh, the, uh, the data analytics. Right? That means what you learn is very useful. Right? <laughs> In recent years, we have concentrated on bringing those techniques together into what we think is the industry's most advanced yield management system, Dynamo. The development of the American Airlines yield management system has been a long, difficult, and expensive job. But our investment has paid off. We estimate that yield management has provided us with about $1.4 billion of incremental revenue in the last three years. And we expect it to provide at least $500 million annually for the foreseeable future. As we continue to invest in the enhancement of Dynamo, we expect to capture ever better control of our prices and our inventories. significant changes in the airline industry occurred in 1978 when Congress passed the Airline Deregulation Act. Deregulation changed the marketplace dramatically. We suddenly found ourselves in competition with a host of low-cost carriers who used discount fares to fill their planes. The resulting price wars led to overcrowded planes and lower profits. This prompted American to find a way to work smarter. While we needed to fill a portion of the plane with these price-sensitive passengers, we could not turn away full fare passengers in the process. Our answer to working smarter was the creation of a new division called yield management. This division helps us manage our inventory of airline seats. 
It also allows America to realize over $500 million additional dollars in revenue per year. To understand the concept of yield management, you must first understand the nature of our product, the airline seat. Its value only exists until the minute a flight departs. Unlike other businesses, we can't have an end-of-the-year clearance sale. We can't have a post-departure liquidation to sell off vacant seats. So, we must effectively manage our inventory prior to departure. Yield management uses two techniques to help us meet this objective, overbooking and discount allocations. We overbook because many people who hold reservations at the time of departure do not show up for their flight. To fill a plane, it is necessary to sell more reservations than there are physical seats. But filling the airplane is not the only goal. We must also determine the best mix among discount, full fare, local, and connecting passengers on an aircraft. Discount allocations is the method we use to do this. Through these two methods, we meet our objective of flying the most passengers possible at the highest fares possible. We are assisted by a computerized decision system that collects historical data and forecasts our passenger behavior. Yield management specialists constantly monitor and update this system for over 1 million American and American Eagle flights per year. Now, let's talk about the overbooking process. Passengers who cancel reservations or who do not show up cause many problems and needlessly hold space sought by others. Overbooking compensates for some of these problems. With a 70% load factor, overbooking allows American to accommodate an additional 10 million passengers on their first choice of flight. It also generates over $250 million additional revenue per year. Because passengers may cancel long-standing reservations even on short notice, it is important to sell above capacity. In fact, it takes between two and three reservations to result in one boarded passenger. History tells us that on average, 13% of the passengers holding reservations at departure will not show up for the flight. We mentioned earlier that the net revenue contribution from booking above capacity is over $250 million. This contribution could be even greater, but sometimes we make costly forecasting errors which result in two problems, product spoilage and oversales. First, let's discuss product spoilage. Product spoilage occurs if we underestimate our overbooking levels. This means we deny sales on a flight and depart with empty seats. Our product is spoiled. And spoilage means lost revenue. If we overestimate our overbooking levels, we run the risk of oversales or more people showing up at the gate than there are seats available. Oversold situations can also result when agent and sales personnel book above authorized inventory levels, weight restrictions are imposed, or when equipment substitutions occur. We recognize that overbooking flights can create stress for both the customer and you. For example, some customers on full flights may feel apprehensive because we can't give them a seat until close to departure. This uncertainty adds to the gate agent's workload in the last five minutes before departure. Recognition and careful planning for these flights can help alleviate most problems. Planning includes recognizing problem flights, evaluating alternative services, and adjusting inventory levels. Yield management operational support staff are on duty during airport hours to help with this planning process. Remember, we overbook because American cannot afford to forego the additional revenue that overbooking generates. Even with overbooking, 99.9% .9 of all passengers board their flight as originally booked. Compared to the other major carriers, AA's record is by far the best in the industry. In those few situations when it is necessary to leave someone at the gate, American has developed a uniquely successful airport volunteer program. Historically, the last person who arrived for an oversold flight was denied boarding. This customer tended to be a time-sensitive business traveler paying full fare. Now, passengers who are not time-sensitive are asked to give up their seats in return for a travel voucher and a confirmed seat on a later flight. American's airport volunteer program positively resolves this situation for both the customer and American Airlines. Last year, American had to deny boarding to approximately 500 passengers who wished to travel on their original flight and who did not volunteer. This means that only one out of every 100,000 passengers was involuntarily denied a seat. 
Surveys show that those who volunteered to give up their seats felt that their experience was positive. In fact, 94% say they would volunteer again. So now you can see how the overbooking process works for America and helps us keep our load factors high. The second inventory technique we use to maximize revenue is discount allocations. In addition to the $250 million American realizes from overbooking each year, we also realize $270 million from discount allocations. Because the demand for discount seats is tremendous, it would not be difficult to fill the plane with low fare passengers. However, filling a plane with only discount passengers would not be profitable. This means we must limit the number of discount seats. Just as a department store offers many product choices, an airline offers many travel options. Most vacation passengers want to receive discounted fares. But in order to receive a discount, certain restrictions, such as advanced purchase and non-refundability, apply. But business travelers who are willing to pay full price for our product fly on fares which have no restrictions, and they usually make reservations close to their departure date. Our computerized system recognizes the revenue value of each passenger and ranks our seating inventory from highest value to lowest value. These values are put into eight revenue categories called buckets. First, we forecast the demand for high-value seats. Then the number of seats available in lower-priced buckets is limited to what is left over. We continually reevaluate our inventory levels and update Saber on a daily basis. This allows us to protect as many high-value seats as we think we can sell. But there is a balance to maintain since the low fares sell first and the full fares normally sell just before departure. If we save too many seats for high-revenue passengers and the demand does not materialize, the plane departs with empty seats. This means lost revenue. On the other hand, if we sell too many discount seats, we have not saved enough seats for high-value, late-booking business passengers. This also means a loss of revenue, because we have turned away the highest-value customer. Hopefully, you can now understand why we limit certain discounted fares. Although we know there are customers eager to purchase these fares, it would not be profitable for America. All right. Uh... Let me, let me show show you uh, there this uh, um, I, so yeah so we understand the background of uh, this uh, yield management uh, so uh, the thing is that the uh, customer with a higher Higher values are likely to uh, book, book later, and the customer who book early, um, uh, they are usually or they would like to, to pay uh, to pay less. Right. So let me sh show you this uh, an analysis is by doing this exercise. Right. So let let's say we have uh, a plane to fill in, and there's uh, different categories, right. and the demand we. Uh, the demand is over here for each category. Right? For example, Y0 is uh, uh, 12, 6, uh, then Y1 is 6, etc. For each uh, class, we have uh, uh, a revenue. Right? We, have, we have a, a revenue. So if we can do a first degree price discrimination, right? we don't consider who booked first or who booked late. Right? So we will first uh, uh, give seat to the higher value customer. And the total seat we can give is 138, uh, but the total demand is 175. So there got, got to be some uh, 37 uh, passengers at least who cannot uh, get that seat. Right? So if we can charge whatever people uh, is willing to pay, we will first give seat to these 12 people. Right? So we can make this amount of money. Right? Then give seat to uh, the uh, six people over here, 10 people over here, three people for Y3, 59 for Y4, and 21 for Y5. Then we still have like a 27 seat for Y6. So in, in, the, in the end, you know, everyone from Y0 to Y5 get a seat. Right? So 37 uh, uh, people from Y6 do not get, get their ticket. And the maximum pro uh, profit we can make is here, 22,545. Uh, right? 
So uh, if we allow, uh, allow people to get ticket right, based on uh, when they call us, right, so these 64 people will get the seat first, right, then these 21 people, then these 59. Oops, it's already over the capacity. All right, so we can only accommodate 53. That makes our plane uh, full. Right? So no one here can get a seat based on the time they call. So you can see we can only make 15,984 over, over here. Right? So the yield management system says now we, um, we will estimate how many we allow to, to sell. Uh, how, how many uh, tickets are we allowed to sell at each category? Each category. Right. So now uh, here, here's how, how it works. Right. So first, uh, this Y6 uh, category people call, right. we are allowed to sell 32 tickets. There are 40, uh, 46, 40, uh, 64 demand, but we sell 32 tickets. So 32 people cannot get on board. So then the Y5 people call us, we are allowed to sell 20 because the demand is 21. So one people cannot get on, on board. Then Y4 people, because the demand uh, as an allowance is 40. So we give 40. Right? And here Y3, we are allowed to sell eight, but demand is only three. So everyone get a ticket. The Y2, everyone get a ticket. Y1, everyone get a ticket. Why zero? Everyone get a ticket. So in in the end, you will see uh, we sell 123 uh, tickets, right? But the profit is nine uh, nineteen thousand six hundred something. It's much higher than this uh, worst scenario case. Very close to the uh, pretty close to the best one. Right? So. Um, you can see that, uh, uh, actually, I learned a lot from watching this video. I didn't know there's a 13% no-show rate. Right? I thought everyone will go to go there. Uh, but that's uh, the benefit of uh, using data to tell you, right? Um, your personal experience may, may be wrong. Right? And by doing this yield management system, they can save five over 500 million per year. Right? That's a lot of, uh, of money. Right. So you can think about it as an exercise, right? We have this critical thinking exercise, right? So if you are managing this yield management system uh, for an airline company, right? So my question for you is what information is needed for this uh, revenue system, right? What kind of information you need to capture in, uh, capture in order to make a good pre uh, prediction? Uh, so that I will leave it as an exercise for you. Now you can go back to the video. They talk about the different information you collect. Now just be a little bit more careful uh, to pick useful information from everywhere. So uh, implementation. Uh, so knowing how to do that is one thing. Uh, implementation is, uh, is an, an another thing. Uh, so in this, this case, we... Um, we use forecast, right? forecast, forecast combine all the info, information uh, to help us predict. And you can imagine right? that the factors you use, the information, the information you use to predict needs to be constantly updated. Constantly updated, right? Uh, so because uh, things will change, right? <laughs> change, uh, change uh, every every year, if not every month or every day, it is very complicated system. You can imagine you need to uh, constantly updating this this uh, function, right? and that's a scientific approach. Uh, gets gets you a lot of money. Right? So we have already showed this uh, uh, comparison called uh, this opportunity cost. Right? Opportunity opportunity cost is compared to the best scenario case. Right? So uh, how much does it cost you to implement one case? Right? So this was a case, uh, the opportunity cost is uh, maximum, right? So the, you can potentially make this amount of money, but you only make this amount. So the opportunity cost is 6 
1561. On contrary, right, here the opportunity cost is about the two, 2,000 something, right? Two, 2,000 something, and you compare to the worst case, you gain 3,600, even though the plane is not filled up. However, uh, implementation issues, right? So uh, you need to be fair to consumers, right? So this is a case that was actually widely discussed in 2017. It's uh, gener generated a lot of uh, 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 discussions, uh, particularly when, you know, now the social media is everywhere, right? You can uh, comment, produce your thoughts uh, everywhere. So this case was widely discussed. Uh, 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 so on that, on that day, they overbooked, uh, it's United Airlines. Not all the airlines use very similar system, right? So they uh, overbooked and forcefully remove uh, passengers. So this, uh, this doctor uh, was not willing to get off the plane because he needs to see a patient uh, in, in the next day. But he was uh, randomly, I don't know how it went, but randomly <laughs> selected to be removed from the uh, plane. He did not want to and uh, uh, they beat him up. Right? Uh, but uh, that is considered very unfair to consumers and uh, uh, consumers do react. <laughs> to react. You, can, you can see how uh, much consumers don't like it. Right? And they produce this. Right? So this is a uh, uh, Lego set, right? uh, passenger removal uh, play set, right? train your future uni United <laughs> crew how to forcefully re remove pass passengers. Right? Um, and your competitors also react, right? Like uh, Southwest, I say that. If we cannot beat our competitors, uh, we beat <laughs> our customers. <laughs> so they go along with this uh, United uh, flight. But Southwest says, no, no, we, we beat our competitors, not you. <laughs> so uh, you know that, uh, is, that uh, event actually cost, uh, um, United Airlines half a billion on the stock market, right? And uh, later, later they you know, say, "No, we will." Uh, I was a United customer. I fly to uh, to to US before, so I uh, they consider me as a customer. They send all the customers an email, say, "Now we use it to um, offer up to fifteen hundred for." Uh, voluntary leaving the plane, but now this offer can go to ten thousand dollars. Right, it should be the way, right? As long as you increase uh, uh, the price for you uh, for people to uh, voluntarily leave, no other people will will um, will take that offer. Right, so you need to think how to be fair at the same time of making maximizing your profit. Right? So that is all for today. I uh, remember to complete uh, our quiz on Friday. And then next week, we are going to talk about advertising models. I, uh, and uh, that, uh, that uh, of, yes, any questions? So the, so the quiz will be, uh, will cover contents from week four to seven. Right, week, week four to seven, all the required con uh, content. Another question is, uh, I use Mac. Um, so I tried, uh, so the solver does, does not work. So if you are using Mac, I would recommend that you, you uh, use a compute, computer on campus. Uh, as far as I, I know now, uh, all the computers on campus, not only those in the computer labs, they have this Excel uh, installed and they, uh, all of them are capable of using Sova. Uh, that is one thing. Another thing is if you think your uh, laptop is not stable enough, you can also uh, use uh, the computers, uh, computers on campus. Right? Uh, that will avoid any potential issues. Uh, pricing, yes. Pricing is taught in week seven and all the contents from week four to week seven will be in quiz two. Any other questions?
All good? Um, sorry for the other over time. That's all for today. See you next week. Thank you.